The Dave Hooker Show. A presentation of Off the Hook Sports. Objective insight. Expertise. Top guest. Available on YouTube. And the Off the Hook Sports app. Download now for free. Also available on offthehooksports.com. I compute and obey. Now to Dave Hooker. Ready. So one of the first things they teach you in the radio biz is not to reference previous technical difficulties because new viewers might not have any idea you had technical difficulties. But I am going to say this really quickly. Coming back from SEC Media Days and having those yesterday. Grrr. And kudos to the one, the only Caleb Calhoun for handling that. That being said, overdone. We will not even we will not even refer to the bad TD. The good TD is touchdown. The bad TD is technical difficulties. So it's over and done. Clean break. Here we go, Caleb Calhoun. I am so excited to visit with you the week after SEC Media Days. And I want to take a quick second. To say major, major kudos to Caleb Calhoun and what he did over the week. The first day I knew, and I didn't even say anything, it's going to be like this crazy sort of um, just frenetic pace, people running around, and then you settle into a zone. And then next thing I know, You've got uh, Caleb Calhoun. Uh, he is interviewing Heather Dennett on his own. He's interviewing uh, Omari Thomas on his own, and he's just knocking it out of the park. I also want to take a second to uh, thank uh, Caleb Jarreau, who was in the newsroom and turning out Tennessee-related content. And I don't know anybody else that did that. I don't know anybody else that brought you the amount of interviews that we did. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of the Calebs and uh, very pleased with the week we had. So that's a TD. That's a touchdown in Nashville, Tennessee. Kudos, uh, Caleb Calhoun, to you, sir. And if you had to pick one word to describe your first SEC media days, and it was my 25th, eesh, and I even missed a couple because I wasn't assigned to it with ESPN. But I counted it up as my 25th, which makes me old. What did you think? Uh, one word to describe SEC Media Days 2023 Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, that's easy. Chaotic. <laughs> chaotic. <laughs> and I mean, by the way, I'm not the only one who thought it was chaotic. There were a lot of people, because it's not in Nashville regularly, that thought it was a little chaotic. That had been there doing it longer than you even that I talked to that had thought it was chaotic. No, it, it was very chaotic, and there were some there were some issues that that Nashville I don't think could do much about. There was road construction on the outside, so it was tough getting there every day. But I, I do think that you've seen whatever COVID may have done, and it it, it canceled the event essentially in 2020. But you've seen the SEC just bounce back. And there were a thousand credentialed media members. I believe there were about 42 members, including us on Radio Row. They're going to expand that to about 50 when they broadcast from Dallas next week, which uh, we'll be in attendance of. And uh, next year, not next week. Next year, next year. <laughs> I don't think we have the energy to go to Dallas next week for this. No, we do not. So we, we, we have a lot to get to and looking back and we'll continue to bring back some of those interviews and as, as we continue to kind of revisit, may reshuffle some things a little bit. I want to give you my impression of the two balls that I interviewed. Uh, one was Jacob Warren, who no surprise was fantastic at the media. Uh, he's the ball report brought to you by Bassey Lawn and Garden. He's on that each and every week. So I wasn't surprised. Uh, we had some fun because I knew he'd be asked the same old questions. Was it, Oppenheimer or Barbie for him. And he said both. And then Joe Milton, you think of these guys, you know, they're on the same team. They're on the same side of the ball. And Joe Milton didn't know anything about Barbie. And uh, Joe Milton, though, did share, if you haven't had a chance to watch this video, and it's something that I hope to grow into a feature story on Joe before the beginning of the season, he talked about how influential his grandmother was. 
those are the type of things that you don't get in the press conference interviews. So I also want to thank uh, the University of Tennessee for making those guys available. You get to you get to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, Amari Hand, what did you – or Amari Thomas. Thomas. Thomas, Amari Thomas. What did you pull away from that interview? What stood out the most? Because out of the three of those, um, I, I would argue that he is as important as any. Because if he has a all-SEC defensive lineman type of year this year, then Tennessee's in going to be in great shape. Jacob Warren, because of the receivers they have and other tight ends, could they scheme around him if if something happened to him? Yes, we know Nico's behind Joe Milton, but Omari Thomas is kind of like the guy you point to and you say, man, if he came out of the box and he's suddenly a John Henderson or an Albert Hainsworth, this is a different football team. Would you agree with that? Yes, and he says he believes he's one of the best defensive linemen in the SEC. That, that's a direct quote from him. He says, I feel like I'm one of the best defensive linemen in the SEC. He's really ready to show it this year. I thought he had a really good, I thought he had a really good splash semi breakout year last year. Um, so I I think that, that we could see a lot from him. Most importantly, he prefers money back yo to key Glock, and he prefers three six to Yo Gotti. For those, for those people who don't understand Memphis references, because he's from Memphis, which I am from Memphis too. And we both agreed that, and Ramon Foster and I spoke about this too, the best high school football is in West Tennessee, guys, in the state. Sorry, it is. Hey, 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 hey. My Knoxville Cats are hanging tight. My Pal Panthers, <laughs> my Pal Panthers won their first state title ever two years ago. So, I went to I went through three years of PMS, as I mentioned this before, Powell Middle School, to get my PhD, my Pal High diploma. By the way, Travis saying the worst TD, of course, is STD. Yeah, that's worse than technical difficulties, I guess. I've never had one, so I would know. Um, and Elias yeah. says, so which of you voted for Vandy to win the SEC? We'll get into that. I mean, you should have your you should have your vote taken away if you voted for Vanderbilt. And Travis says, did Joe ask you why you hate him? No, but Joe did say at the end of that, I said, hopefully this is more fun than the other interviews you did. And he said, man, this is a lot more fun. And it was the end of the day too. So I could tell he was tired, but uh, we had, we had a good time and talking about his grandmother was, was something special. So he recently lost his great grandmother and both his great grandmother, grandmother, had a very big part in raising him. So uh, we're digging into that uh, good stuff and hope to have a feature on him, just depending who we can run down. Because believe it or not, report dates August the 1st. Caleb, can you believe that? Right around the corner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're close. So go ahead and click that like button. Please subscribe. You know we greatly appreciate that. Subscriptions through the roof over the week that we were in SEC Media Days. A couple of things that stood out, according to our viewers, were, of course, David Cutcliffe was one. Andy Staples of On3 uh, was another. Uh, Joe Milton, uh, well into the four digits when it comes to uh, views. And I feel like I'm I'm forgetting someone. Uh, oh, Rick Neuheisel did incredibly well. And he said, he said, that was a lot of fun. And I said, can I get your cell phone for maybe another time? And he said, yeah. So there we go. Let's get to... A question that would not be necessarily applicable to this year's Vols, but we have the NFL and their running backs banding together to address the position's reduced financial power. Here's what's happening. Even the Saquon Barclays, which, Caleb, I believe you and I would agree is the air quotes generational running back of the past few years. If, it, if you're going to give anybody money, it's him over the past five years. But nowadays, they shuffle them in and out. It wouldn't be Ezekiel Elliott, and I'm a Cowboys fan, and that's horrible. So has there ever been an ir irreplaceable Tennessee running back? That will lead us to today's tough question. And today's tough question is brought to you by our friends at Zen Sports. Today's tough question. Take a side. Take a stand. The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of offthehooksports.com. In a lot of ways, we could argue Tennessee was ahead of the curve because it seemed they had three, four, five, six, seven, eight running backs ready to go at different points during their most successful times in their history. So 
has there ever been an irreplaceable Tennessee running back? I want your thoughts on the message board. If you can, again, hit that like button, turn your notifications on if you haven't already. So we've got some big things uh, coming up. But today's tough question, has there ever been an irreplaceable Tennessee running back? And it's brought to you by Zen Sports. Zen Sports, the new sports book in Tennessee, revolutionizing the way you earn sports betting rewards. That means no more deposit bonuses that turn into deposit nightmares. On Zen Sports, what you see is what you get. And with their cash rewards program, you get a lot of cash. For a welcome bonus, earn an unlimited 5% cash back on your betting volume for your first 15 days when you sign up with the code HOOKED. That's right. HOOKED, unlimited, 5% cash back. Pretty awesome. Keep betting, keep earning with up to 3% cash back on your betting volume every month. After that, and refer friends to earn a percentage of their betting volume as cash rewards, too. Zen Sports is bringing the cash back to Tennessee. So if you bet big on sports, you want to be betting on Zen Sports. Zen Sports betting just got better. May I tell you a story about a Tennessee running back that was replaced, that was one of the most talented running backs in Tennessee football history? I'm waiting to get my hair cut. I believe it was a Sam's. By the way, we welcome on Sport Clips very soon as one of our new advertisers. So that's where you want to go. Support our sponsors, including Zen Sports. Download the app today. I'm sitting there waiting to get my hair cut. Uh, Her name was Lori because I'm very particular even when I was 10 years old about who cut my hair. And I'm sitting there and I hear a break in on WIVK that Reggie Cobb was not available for the upcoming Alabama game. And this was probably a Tuesday-ish because he had failed a drug test. And he would not be available and he was suspended for the rest of the season. You immediately think, Reggie Cobb, there is no possible way that Tennessee could overcome that. But Tennessee did. And Tennessee was still known as running back you even without Reggie Cobb and when he was suspended and essentially dismissed, I guess I should say, from Tennessee. So that that illustrates what I believe is one of the best traditions of running backs in the nation, not just the SEC. If you can replace a Reggie Cobb and they were uh, able to, and you're going to bring up another player, Caleb, that they were able to replace Tennessee was, you're talking about a pretty incredible incredible group of running backs that Tennessee has had over the past generation when I say generation I'm talking about 45 plus years yeah I think that and and that was the proof of how irreplaceable they were I mean Tennessee had a a future NFL 2000 yard rusher go down for the year in 1998 and proceeded to still dominate the SEC in rushing and win the national championship 2001 they lost, they have lost, I'm speaking of Jamal Lewis, obviously. Jamal Lewis leaves, Travis Henry comes in. Travis Henry sets the all-time Tennessee football rushing record. Both those running backs go on to be NFL Pro Bowlers. Yet the guy who replaces them, who's nowhere near in their class talent-wise, Travis Stevens, has the best single season in Tennessee football rushing history, going for over for nearly 1,400 yards in 2001. I'm having trouble looking back in history and finding a time when a running back was irreplaceable. And I'm even going into the Robert Nealon years, guy. Robert Nealon years. Okay, you know you hear of George Gaffigo, you hear of Beatty Feathers, uh, you hear of Gene McIver. When uh, George Gaffigo was dominating at Tennessee in the 30s, they had a three-time All-American guard in Bob Suffrage, the only three-time All-American in school history, another guard in Ed Malinsky, and a tackle in Abe Shires. Okay, that's three All-Americans he was running behind. I something tells me if Cafago now I will say Cafago did get hurt in the Rose Bowl of 39 and Tennessee lost to USC that year, but I think that was by far the best team they had played at the same time. So there's I, I, I'm not I can't think of a time when a running back was irreplaceable, honestly. No, and Elias had one that would have been in response to Reggie Cobb. So it was uh, Chuck Webb that stepped in in the the, the next few years and. Uh, if you look at that group in particular, I think Chuck Webb is the best running back that maybe I've ever seen in person. <laughs> but when he went down, there was a Tony Thompson that I believe rushed for 223 yards in his first game as a starter. Now, 
a lot of this speaks to Tennessee's offensive linemen, and we don't want to overlook those. I mean, there were there were tremendous holes, and uh, Tennessee was able to benefit from that. You mentioned Jamal Lewis. They go to Travis Henry. Was Travis Henry a special back that would rush for 2,000 yards in an NFL season? No, but he was a very, very, very good college back. No question. And a good – And he was a good NFL back. And a good NFL back. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, you know, the one that I think would have been irreplaceable – is Alvin Kamara. And the reason I think he would have been irre- irreplaceable is he gave the balls just enough of a spark that uh, we all know Jalen Hurd was not fit for Butch Jones's offensive system. It was a get in recruiting he felt like he had to have or it would have looked bad. But Alvin Kamara should have run the ball much more. We all agree. But what is that offense without his two or three plays a game? He only touched the ball like nine or ten times a game. But it seems like he would have two or three that would at least move the chain or something. So you're more dialed into those years with Butch because that was the weird part about SEC media days is Caleb kept wearing his bring Butch back shirt in front of the other. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But you were more dialed in. Had they lost Alvin Kamara, who steps in for that versatile role? And how big of a step back does Tennessee take because they're depending on Jalen Hurd, who wasn't a good fit? He didn't get – Alvin Kamara didn't get hurt, but I'm trying to rack my brain of one guy that would be the most difficult to replace. No, actually, that's the thing. I'm pushing back. I, even Alvin Kamara. Alvin Kamara did get hurt in 2016. John Kelly came in and was as productive. Now, yes, Jalen Hurd himself was not fit for it, but John Kelly wasn't as fast as Alvin Kamara, wasn't as good in general as a as an athlete, but in that system was just as productive as Alvin Kamara because the system was Josh Dobbs and Mike DeBoard. And as long as so as long as you fit the prototype, it didn't really matter who the running back was. So I, I have to be honest, even Alvin Kamara, who should have gotten more touches than Jalen Hurd doesn't necessarily mean he was irreplaceable because we saw what happened when Alvin Kamara got hurt in 2016. John Kelly actually averaged six and a half yards a carry in 2016, got over 600 yards. Alvin Kamara averaged under six yards a carry in 2016. Okay, so let's talk this year. If you had to have the most irreplaceable back, uh, who would it be? Elias says Arian Foster in 2005. Travis says Alvin Kamara should have been running back number one. Uh, I agree with that. Who would Arian Foster's backup have been? My goodness, I covered that team, and I don't really remember anybody. Ontario Hardesty, maybe? He was hurt. At, uh, Coker, LaMarcus Coker may have been the backup that year. Yeah. Because Jim uh, Riggs already went down with a season-ending injury, right? Yeah. I I mean, I loved Arian Foster. He hated me, but I loved Arian Foster and what he brought to the game. Uh, Hardesty is another one that we never saw the top end because it was it was so pitiful and, and – I felt so bad for him in post-practice interviews. We'd say, how's your knee? I mean, we couldn't ask anything else. And at one point he hurt the other knee. And I can remember saying, how's your knee? And he goes, it's getting better. It's feeling better. And I said, Montario, I'm sorry. I, I didn't specify which knee. Um, is it, How's your left knee first? And how's your right? I mean, he was that beat up. He gave it all for Tennessee. So what's – is there an irreplaceable running back on this roster – I don't think so. I think Tennessee would have to lose two tailbacks to feel like that their running back room got dereft or devoid of talent. Um, You know, Jalen Wright's probably the most proven slash gifted of the group. Jabari Small's not far behind. We all saw what uh, Cameron was able to do in the spring, which I think means a lot. Uh, let's talk about the rest of the running backs. Khalifa Keith's going to be a short down back, so he's very replaceable if they had to. I, 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 and then Tobias brings up a great point. If two went down, I think Dylan Sampson would make the shift to running back more. Um, I think Dylan Sampson is going to play different positions, including the slot some this year. But I think that he would be a full-time running back if two went down. It would definitely be Dylan Sampson, who I love his speed and ability. But – I would have to take two to say that Tennessee's running backs took a hard hit via injury or academics or whatever else. I don't think there's an irreplaceable guy on the roster this year. Do you? 
No, and I, I still didn't even know if two went down, they'd be irreplaceable. I mean, last year, Josh Heupel didn't have a power back. All he had to do was move Princeton Fant over and put him at running back and use him as the power back. And this is the problem with running backs in the NFL. And this is what people don't get. And Dave, you might find this interesting, but I read a great tweet thread last week. The problem with running backs in the NFL is too many of them now are good and physically gifted. You know, in the 90s, Jamal Lewis, even though I thought running backs were replaceable then, Jamal Lewis was a rare specimen in the 90s, right? You did not get a Jamal Lewis every day in, on a recruiting trail. Now, half the NFL has Jamal Lewis's in there. It's not that special anymore to get a Jamal Lewis. Do they really? And I think so. I mean, like, I, the, the, the raw athleticism, because let's be honest, the number one thing, a running back is raw athleticism, and all they have to do is learn how to pick up a block. That's all they really got to do when they get to college, right? Yeah, but I think Jamal Lewis was another level, especially when you consider the fact that he had the ACL injury and that probably took a step away. Um, I, I I think when you talk about the most talented tailbacks in the past 25 years in the NFL, maybe we're talking Barkley. Maybe we're talking Elliott at their prime. Elliott likes to eat. What about Marshall Falk maybe? or But different. But anyway, yeah. in, terms of a, in terms of a power back, I think – I think Jamal Lewis is is right up there, so I'm not having. But I guess where I'm at is the problem with running backs is there's too many good ones. There's too many good ones, so there's nobody that can separate themselves from the pack. See, with quarterbacks, let's be honest. Any time, uh, any it, at any era of football, there's never more than ten good quarterbacks, and there's 32 teams. But you can find 65 good running backs among 32 teams. And I would argue. I would argue that it's not. There's that many more running backs. It's that if you have a Jamal Lewis, you should wear down uh, an opposing defense for 20 to 25 carries, and then he starts to really blossom. But I don't think people want to go that way. So uh, that was uh, today's tough question brought to you by our friends at Zen Sports. And then this topic that is, uh, let's say, interesting. So, uh, Barbie and Oppenheimer, I uh, was able to get home Friday a little bit early. And uh, here's the map at Barbie and Oppenheimer. So, what does this say about the SEC? Explain this map to me because I got home Friday early enough. And if you're uh, watching on our video channel, you can see the map how Barbie is just uber popular. Oppenheimer's phenomenal. I'm not going to see Barbie. Joe Milton is not going to see Barbie. Jacob Warren is going to see both. Um, so Barbie Oppenheimer, what does this list mean in this graph you have? Cause Barbie's huge in the South, huge, by the way, Derrick Henry is a tailback that, um, I don't believe Tennessee could just move on without talking about the Titans, but go ahead with Barbie. Tennessee went seven and one when Derrick Henry went down two years ago, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, bar this, this map shows. Google search trends, which one had more search trends over the weekend, Barbie or, or Oppenheimer by state? And as you guys can see, the SEC dominated Barbie. So in the Barbie and Oppenheimer bait, the Northeast, the New Yorks, Vermonts, New Hampshire's, Maine's, Massachusetts, they all preferred Oppenheimer. Deep South, it was Barbie, Barbie, Barbie. Look at Mississippi if you guys can see that. It's plus 20 to Barbie in Mississippi and plus 14 to Louisiana. And plus 12 to Arkansas. Those are the three most Barbie states in the country. They okay, prefer. So, so let's ask the hard questions. Okay. Why does the South prefer Barbie over Oppenheimer? Because our Oppenheimer is a great movie. I walked out of there and I said this, and you will not hear me say this probably again in my life, Caleb. That was Godfather level. That was Godfather one and two level. I thought it was that good. So come on, Barbie, let's go party, Mr. Jones says. No, I'm not going to party. My son saw it and said, Daddy wouldn't get it. And he's probably right. But why does the South love Barbie more than Oppenheimer? By the way, which has a reference to Oak Ridge in it. And I, I, it's historic. And it's, I thought it was one of the, I'm not ready to say top 10 yet because I like these things to sink in and see it twice because there are a lot of names. You know, you got to put together like the second time you see The Godfather, you're like, oh, I get it. Um, I, but it's it's right there. It's definitely top 25 movies 
that I've ever seen of all time. And it's probably going to end up in the top 10 when I when I mull over it. So why in the heck does the SEC care about Barbie? They, I mean, when I interviewed Amari Thomas, by the way, Amari was 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 pro Barbie. And I, I wonder if in the world. Do you think do you think this this tracks with like the percentage of people in a state that have college degrees? Like, do you think like the more college educated a state is, the more pro Oppenheimer it is? Because that would explain why the Northeast is so pro Oppenheimer, wouldn't it? I don't know. I, I just, I mean. No, by the way, most pro Oppenheimer was New Mexico plus 16 because Oppenheimer basically took place in New Mexico. And yes. But like, but here's my thing on the Barbie thing. I understand that it's, it's supposed to be, um, it's supposed to be a satire over the, I understand all of that. And we're not going to get sidetracked on movies for a long time. As a matter of fact, I'm about to move on, but I understand it's supposed to be a side tire and you're supposed to get it. And it's not just about Barbie having fun in her playhouse. Okay. I get that. I understand. But still, who would rather watch that in the South than Oppenheimer, which if they hadn't have found the minerals in Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge is barely a train stop between, (laughs) between Knoxville and the next place you're going. I mean, how can you not? I, I don't. I don't understand how you can't like. Uh, I, you can't like Oppenheimer. I mean, I will say. I, I, I'm going to say this. People Barbie think- is based on a true story. Mr. Jones says, "That's it's called." Uh, I think that's called sarcasm. Oh no the be- the best one is still uh, Elias. You got to put that one up. A Barbie watch party with Coach O. Hey, what's going on, Barbie? <laughs> no, but we're pretty good. Barbie like, I'm with. Barbie like I'm with Ken. And it goes like that don't matter. What does that matter? <laughs> yeah. I hate the fact I don't serve uh, a Red Bull at the front, so I brought my own uh, and maybe something else to go with it. Uh, now Travis does give us this. Margot Robbie is uber hot, but let's face it, Oppenheimer is an intelligent crowd. Margot Robbie is super hot. She is super hot. Some people were saying she was mid last week, though. She was what? Mid. Oh, I got to teach Dave about the. the what does mid people. mean? Mid is the new word for basic. Oh. Well, everybody turns basic at some point. Hell, I'll, I passed basic 20 years ago. Um, so, I don't know. Are you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you just saying in your prime you were way above basic, Dave? I'm saying in my prime I was... Could you have played 10? No. I'm saying in my prime I was well done. And right now, um, if going the other way, I'm like mid-rare, the way I order a steak. Was that a read? Well, medium rare is better than well done. What are you talking I about? I agree, but I'm just trying to use the uh, do the reverse. The, By the way, just let's from a football perspective, since Ryan Gosling played Ken, y'all never forget that before he was Ken, Ryan Gosling was an absolute liability at cornerback and remember the Titans. <laughs> true he was. We all got that one guy, don't we? On our high school team, we look back at, and I'm not gonna say his name publicly, but I know who it was, and the reason that the Powell Panthers didn't win a championship in 1991 was one dude that they just absolutely went after. But we've all got that guy. That guy's Ken, in my opinion. All right, coming up, ranking every member of the Vol staff by importance. And Caleb Calhoun has done this on offthehooksports.com. So we'll do that. And I just want to thank everyone with the kind notes they passed along with the SEC Media Day's coverage. I'll just go ahead and tell you, adding this whole, uh, I don't know what they call it, video aspect is a little bit more difficult than you might think. And without Caleb Calhoun, it would have uh, it would have been uh, a, just a fiasco. Uh, but Elias has a bunch of dudes saying Margot Robbie is like a 5 out of 10. And then he uh, says, but they're almost all 2 out of 10 dudes. Exactly. Like, let's be honest. There's some females in the world and and all those, and the females listening I would like your input there are a couple of females that I got that, that 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 I have been absolutely starstruck around and you know Caleb I can talk to anybody right but I did get around well, Layla Kiffin was one that I was like oh my gosh she's wearing heels and stuff and in person it was it was stunning it was stunning and I've been around well, the other half ones. the reason Tennessee hired him. They're like, we want Layla Kiffin recruiting in Knoxville. And not a bad out. idea. Not a bad idea. Tennessee's most important coaches coming up next. He's Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker off the hook sports.
Sun, sand, and salt water, the beach is a very relaxing place. Unless you wear contacts. Ow! Open your eyes to the best the beach has to offer with LASIK Vision Correction from Campbell Cunningham Laser Center. Ah. Hi, Mike Davis here with City Heating and Air, reminding you to always dare to compare. Our team provides quality local heating and air service, installation, and maintenance across East Tennessee. We use only the best equipment like American Standard Heating and Air Conditioning for your residential, new construction, or commercial needs. Honesty, dependability, and customer satisfaction have been the cornerstones of our business since 1961. City Heat and Air. There's your man. Our family has been creating one-of-a-kind pieces of jewelry in West Knoxville since 1986. Each piece is a combination of unique processes that bring your idea to life. Every day in our shop, a truly special item with a story all its own is being manufactured in our facility, bringing the history and family sentiment into a whole new generation of life. We are grateful that you chose us to be Knoxville's best jeweler, a title that we value and respect. Because to me, being a jeweler and owning a jewelry store are not the same thing. I'm Rick Terry. I'm a jeweler. And we want to be your jeweler. Kingston Pike and Campbell Station Road in the heart of Farragut and downtown on Gay Street right next to the Tennessee Theater. When you want a hard cider that's easy to enjoy, one that's crafted to perfection, you need Tennessee Cider Company. Some say it's the signature cider of the South. Others say it's the cure to your craving. They all say you'll savor every sip. With a selection of ciders free to sample, all it takes is one taste. Visit TNCiderCompany.com for more information, as well as to shop our ciders and merchandise online. Thirsty yet? Doors open at 10 a.m. You're listening to The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of OffTheHookSports.com. The internet is full of pictures of each and every one of you. Available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the Off The Hook Sports app. Download now for free. He said nothing you people can't do. Also available on OffTheHookSports.com. Welcome back. All right, can you tell us what former NFL standout came up to us? He hosts a show in the Mid-State area and says, hey, I love your all show. Thanks so much for keeping me up to date on the balls because his primary focus would be the Tennessee Titans. So if you can tell us who that was, he was super cool and super nice, and maybe he's watching right now, then I will hook you up with a uh, Hooker T-shirt. Got a couple of those. So uh, go ahead and get on board. And Dean's upset that we're not talking uh, enough, uh, b- enough balls, enough sports. Well, we're doing that right now. Oppenheimer and Barbie is in the background. So Tennessee and their coaching staff has been remarkably consistent throughout the years, um, the past couple of years under Josh Heupel. Whereas I remember when Justin Wilcox left Dooley staff, and I think that was my first year with ESPN, and I heard it from afar, and I thought that's bad news because I think he's a good football coach. Now, he hasn't had great success since, and I don't know that he's a head coach, but I thought that he was a good defensive coordinator. Caleb, would you agree on that? Oh, yes. I think Justin Wilcox is a very, very good defensive coordinator. Hasn't had great success as a head coach, but you know you, you can have that. that. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. <laughs> and he has had success as a, as a coordinator and had success at Tennessee. So take me to your story, if you can. It's on offthehooksports.com. And – Tell me how you went about it, ranking every member of the Vols 2023 coaching staff by importance. Now, I don't want to give away the the end because you and I agree, which we're not supposed to do. But when we start talking about the Jerry Max of the world, the Alec Ablins of the world, Kelsey Pope, uh, Brian Jean-Marie, uh, Joey Halsley, uh, Rodney Garner, Mike Eckler, Glenn Ellerby, there's a lot of wiggle room. So how did you determine what coaches fell where? Did you factor in, let's say, 
uh, longevity, how much longer they're going to coach. Did you factor in recruiting? How did you rank them? Because I'm supposed to disagree with you. And we're supposed to have conflict, Skip Bayless style, but I agree with your list. I think it's very strong. And on the message board, let me ask you, who's the most important assistant head coach? The irony is, hint, hint, that it's probably statistically the least successful head coach if you just want to look at it by numbers. But I love where Caleb has uh, gone there. And we'll get to four downs here momentarily. It'll be brought to you by Craft Treat. So you, you take me through your process of how you brought these names into a concise list because I love it. One vote for Rodney Garner already. Go ahead, Caleb. So I ranked it based on three things. One was the actual skill level of the coach themselves, like how their abilities, what they have proven as a head or as an assistant coach at their position, the level of success they had, and the level of success I think they can have. The other one I bring up is the actual level of importance of the role they play. And I think this is where a lot of people are going to get confused. And there's two ways to factor in the importance. One is does your position require a lot of coaching? You and I both know running backs doesn't require a lot of coaching. Am I right, Dave? I mean, that's just a fact. Um, very true. Yeah. And so but you can make up for that, but you can't make up for that if you're pulling in six, four stars a year, right? Exactly. That, that was, that was going to be the third factor, but the, the second factor is, yeah, does your position require a lot of coaching or does someone else have their hands over what you're doing? So a lot of you guys are going to be shocked where I have Joey Halsley. And the reason I have him maybe not as high as you might think is because everything Joey Halsley does, I feel like Josh Heupel's doing too. And then the third one is your ability as a recruiter. And recruiters, that's where irrelevant position coaches matter the most. Is They they need to be, if you're coaching running backs, you need to be on the recruiting trail every day. Like every single day you need to be on the trail. Agreed. Uh, let's take up the look at uh, the list now. Let's take a look at the list now. Easy for me to say. And it's brought to you by Chill Pills. Uh, I'm sorry, crafttreats.com, where they have the Chill Pills. Crafttreats.com, the Chill Pills. Please, please support our advertisers. And you can put in the exclusive promo code off the hook. That's off the hook at crafttreats.com. Get 20% off when you use that exclusive code off the hook. That is off the hook. The Chill Pills will help with your dog's digestive issues and or your pet's digestive issues. Also, arthritis and anxiety. They have the CBD derivative so we've got to vote for garner so here is how the list goes according to caleb calhoun i'll tell you what i think willie martinez the defensive backs uh i think willie martinez is uh, an above average recruiter but right now it's tough for me to have him anywhere but tent based off uh what tennessee has done in the defensive backfield Alec Ablent, tight ends, just got the job. He may turn out to be the next Bill Belichick of the world, but we don't know that right now. Jerry Mack at running backs was eighth. Again, running back is not a terribly difficult position to be able to coach. So I'm assuming you think his recruiting is kind of, eh, it's got to be stellar to stand out at the running back position, right? Yeah, and it's, it, I have him ahead of Ablent and Martinez because I feel like he's actually a better recruiter than both of them. And okay. he is a young, energetic recruiter. But outside of that, yeah, not nothing special yet. Kelsey Pope, you have it seven. I could make a pretty strong argument. He's a little bit higher because of the development of Jalen Hyatt. But let's be honest, I think that's a product of the system. And I, I'm guessing that's kind of where you're going. Yes, I give him more credit for Cedric Tillman. And he was an off-field analyst at the time. But Cedric Tillman will be the first to tell you that Kelsey Pope really developed him. Pope is an expert at developing wideouts. The next step for him is to prove he can actually bring in top receiver talent on their trail. So you got Brian John Marie. We know that Jeremy Banks was recently cut from the NFL. So I think Brian John Marie, when you do this list next year, could be as high as three or as low as nine. Because I don't think he has had elite talent to work with he should have that with keenan pilly beasley uh, and arian carter uh, th they should take a jump this year they should be significantly better and then you have joey halsley at number five as an offensive coordinator now it surprised me a little bit you had him over rodney garner who i think has done a great job of developing defensive linemen i'm and behind Rod rodney garner behind Rod Rodney Gardner. So you had Gardner at four, Halsley at five. Gardner, 
I think it's done a good job of developing defensive linemen and can still recruit. So I was a little bit surprised that you had him um, – that you had him behind or in front of uh, – that you had him in front of uh, Halsley. I was a little bit surprised by that. Well, no, I have him, I have him better than Halsley, though. Okay, it, that you didn't have him higher on the list. And yes. just above Halsley. So I would probably have him in front of in front of Eckler. And then who you have third and LRB, you have second. Now, the one that might surprise people is Tim Banks. If you look at the stats of what Tennessee has done defensively, you would immediately say it can't be the defensive coordinator. But I disagree. I, th- I think that he has done a lot with an uphill battle. Caleb, when he's playing defense with this offense on the other side, not a ton of talent on that side. So I got no problem with you having Tim Banks as as number one. I also like, and I've said this before, I think Tim Banks has been incredibly underrated in what he's put together on a defensive front as far as twists and stunts and different blitz packages. I feel like he's making shepherd's pie. So do you know what shepherd's pie is made out of, Caleb? I'm Irish and I still don't. <laughs> yeah. It's whatever you got left. You just throw it in a pot and then you put mashed potatoes over it. It's whatever you got left. So I feel like that Tim Banks on a weekly basis is making shepherd's pie and he's making pretty good shepherd's pie. Not great shepherd's pie, but good shepherd's pie. So I have no problem with you having him number one. But if somebody didn't cover Tennessee's program closely, they might look at this and say, man, is Caleb best friends with Tim Banks or something? But. Now, I, the, I don't. I don't think that at all. I think kudos to that pick. Yeah, the only question with Tim Binks was last year with the South Carolina game when Jeremy Binks was suspended. It seems like he called off all of his stunts and rushes, but I think he knew that the linebackers were going to struggle the way that without Jeremy Binks in there doing that. And I think that the onus was on the defensive line to play with with their hair on fire in that game. And you and I talked about just the the nature of that day of football resulted in them not playing with their hair on fire. I think they were watching football games all day and they were trying to worry if USC could lose to jogging for their college football playoff spot. And then the South Carolina game kicks off and they're just not ready to go. And I I don't think. Caleb, it seems like we're, when we're judging Tennessee, we almost have to take that game just completely off the table with the exception of how did Josh Heupel handle the week heading into that Saturday? Now, we can criticize that, but almost everything else that happened along with the hooker injury, and I think they had a bad week of preparation on defense, not because Jeremy Banks purposely undermined anybody, just you had that going on all week. He had, he had missed a team function early in the week. He got in the altercation with Joe Milton over Hendon Hooker. I almost think when you judge these coaches, with the exception of the head coach who should have been able to get things under control earlier in the week, I think you almost have to remove that from the way we judged the balls last year. Yeah, I do too. I do too. It was a combination of everything. You know, Dave, if that's a noon game, I bet Tennessee wins that. I don't know how you feel. I bet Tennessee wins that if it's a noon game. I think defensive line is ready to go. But I think a night game that they're not really that hyped about playing in South Carolina. Again, you you educated me on this. Defensive line, a lot of it is how willing are you to play with your hair on fire on every play? And I think there was just a lot of lethargy on the line. Tim Binks was going to rely on them. So I don't blame him for that. And you're right. The rest of the time, the only other game you could criticize was the Florida game where Anthony Richardson threw all over the field. But that was by design. Tim Binks knew where he was outmanned. And his goal was to say, I'm going to make Florida work the whole field and work the clock to try to score. And if they have to run more plays, they're bound to make a mistake. And there was that Anthony Richardson fumble in the second half. And if Tennessee special teams does its job, then Florida's not in that game in the end. So I think that because of that, I, I I agree with you. Tim Banks is the most important. Now, again, this is a combination of most important and best. I don't think he's the best. If I'm just doing who's the best at their job on this list, I would say Rodney Garner. I'm with you. And the reason I have him at four, though, is you need Glenn Ellerby to develop that offensive line. Like, that's crucial to Josh Heupel's system. And Mike Eckler running special teams adds another element to the game. But – Tim Banks is the most important, and all and the team is going to go. We know Josh Heupel's offense is going to be there. This team is going to go based on two things this year, which is 
Does Joe Milton have the accuracy concerns under control? And does Tim Binks do his job well? Yep. Let's get to four downs right now. Four downs is brought to you by our friends at Craft Treats. Use the promo code off the hook. Get 20% off, including those CBD treats for your pet. Uh, the promo code off the hook saves you 20%. You can use it again and again. Uh, support our advertisers. We greatly appreciate that. Four downs. Four questions. Four answers. The Dave Hooker Show. Four. 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 Downs. A presentation of offthehooksports.com. First down. Which Tennessee assistant that we just mentioned will have the best overall career? So counting what they've done now, and then when Off the Hook Sports celebrates its 20th anniversary in 2042, and Caleb's running this thing because I've been dead a long time, which Tennessee assistant coach will have the best overall career? First down. I'm going to say, I think Alec Ablin. I think he's a rising star. How'd you do that to me? That's who I was going to pick. Ha! (laughs) Sorry. All right. All right. It's Alec Ablin because either Josh Heupel's absolutely right on this guy or he took the easy way out and just elevated. And at this point, I'm giving Josh Heupel the benefit of the doubt on these decisions. Which of the current coaches has had the biggest impact on the balls? That would be called second down. Um, I would say it's Rodney Garner, just because of the recruiting and the, what he's done with the defensive line. I would argue Alex Golish, but he's gone. So I guess you're right. Agreeing way too much on the program. We're going to have to go over these things a little closer in our 345 production meeting every morning. So, uh, Coop, what down is it? Tennessee center Cooper Mays here. Third down. Which of these coaches that we have mentioned is most likely to leave? Will be the first to leave. That will be Willie Martinez because I don't think he's going to like the lack of respect he's getting from people like me. And I don't think the staff themselves really respect Willie Martinez that much. I'm going to say Alec Ablin because I think that he'll get an opportunity to be an offensive coordinator, not a head coach like Golish, but get an opportunity to be a uh, head coordinator, uh, to be an offensive coordinator, not a head coach, but an offensive coordinator. I could see that happening if Tennessee has two more, good years offensively especially three more good years offensively as you would expect that they would have with nico waiting in the wings i wouldn't surprise so do you think go ahead do you think ablin will be hired as an offensive coordinator before hosley is hired as a head coach see that's the direction i was going to go i was going to go that hosley is going to be viewed as hey you're just there why josh heupel runs his offense where somebody like a smaller school could pick an Ablin and say he can bring a lot over, but you don't have to make the commitment as a head coach. So Ablin would be for somebody who wants to run the offense, but doesn't want to have, but doesn't trust the head coaching ability. They just believe in the offense itself. Right. It's uh, it would be like when Tulsa hired uh, Gus Malzahn as the offensive coordinator and they were number one in the nation in offense for two straight years. That, that kind of hire. A Tulsa kind of hire says, I think this Ablin guy uh, may be something. All right, which coach has the best year this year? And a lot of the recruiting is already in the barn, so uh, we can start to lean towards what coach has the best year this year. I'm going to go ahead and throw mine out there. Based off what we think about him, I'm going to say that it is the guy that we've kind of banged up on a little bit, and – I think it's Mike Eklund. I think as a linebackers coach, and if you want to throw Brian John Marie in there as well, because Eckler does a lot of special teams in the outside linebackers, but there's really only one outside linebacker nowadays. Uh, so I think it'd be one of those two at the linebacker position. I think Tennessee goes from very average to uh, pretty good at linebacker with Carter and Peely and Beasley. So I will say those two are the most likely to jump up on the list when Caleb does this list next year. So the two people running the linebackers, Brian G. Mary and Mike Eckler. Yep. I it's your, it's gonna, it's your list. Team. So whoever you decide to give more credit to. Yeah. 
I, I think it's going to be the same person who got it last year. I think it's going to be Kelsey Pope. I think you're going to see another emergence of re- like new receivers that are all superstars this year. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Go ahead and uh, hit that like button. Hit subscribe. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, also, we'll have the Celebrate 98 series coming up very soon. If you haven't checked out Dante Stallworth, he was uh, fantastic. And this just really frustrates me and it makes me think of the Heisman vote which I take very seriously I do Caleb can tell you I do like four or six hours of research before I send in my Heisman vote apparently nobody did any research whatsoever into the league that they cover because Vanderbilt received four votes to win the SEC five Five. They were tied what for fourth the, most. What was he thinking? Release the hounds. The Dave Hooker Show. K- 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 keep cool. A presentation of offthehooksports.com. How does that happen, Caleb? How does Vanderbilt receive five votes to win the SEC? I mean, I'm all for people having different takes and that sort of thing. And if you want to pick South Carolina to win the East – at least you could make an argument for that. If you want to pick A&M to win the West, you could make an argument for that. You and I wouldn't agree with either. But to win the entire league, Vanderbilt, and it happens to be in Nashville, where there's just some TV people that were in attendance because it was in Nashville. And I pick TV people because not all the time, but most of the time, they're the less learned of the media individuals. Is that why they got five votes to win the entire league, right? Not the East. Yeah, the entire league. The entire league. <clears throat> I come on. And people are people can laugh at me on this uh, because people can talk about how this is a this is a joke and whatever. And it's just the writers. I wrote about this this weekend, so this was the first time I ever had a ballot, an official ballot, to vote on things in my life. And y'all can say I was starry eyed being at SEC Media Days, but I took it very, very. Very serious. You weren't starry out at all. You were working hard. Yeah, and I took it. And here's why I took it seriously. I don't think, and Dave, you know this as well as I do. There is no sport where writers have wielded more power than college football. Writers made college football matter. Name national champions. Yes. Yes, writers for the first 130 years of the sport were responsible for who the national champions were. No other sport was like that. And don't think for a, and don't think for a second if they decided they didn't like school X and they kept them around 20 when they should be around 10 that it wouldn't affect where they are in the college football playoff because it would. But anyway, I know they're two separate things, but one day when we have a 12 team college football playoff if the writers don't like coach x because he's hard to deal deal with bill snyder then you start voting him down and then it's harder to make the argument they should be in the 12 team playoff so there's still a ton of power there whether or not they deserve it uh could be the argument but go ahead finish finish your thoughts you did take it seriously you were into it you're like where's my email to fill it out and bam there we go yes and i mean and for those who question this guys sec football is not a thing if grantland rice doesn't exist in the early 20th century. He made SEC football popular because of his writing before the SEC was a thing. Southern writers, the writers that wrote about the Rose Bowl game that changed the South in Washington and Alabama, the writing of that in 1926 was what made college football such a big deal in the South. So I took this very seriously. When you do something as laughable as voting Vanderbilt to win the SEC, Dave, this is the reason white writers have lost the power that they wielded over the last 25 years over college football. And they've had, they still have power, but they don't have the power they once had. And it's because of stuff like this that they've lost their power. And who can blame the powers that be in college football to say, why do we have the, we all laugh at the NCAA and these institutional norms of college football, but they have every right to sit there and say, why should we leave the power in the hands of these writers who are so political with everything they do, they vote on, either as a troll or their feelings on something, that why should we leave the power in their hands? And they have taken so much power away from the writers, writers, and they're going to take power more away. And the AP poll is a huge, fun part of college football. The way they're going right now, if they keep doing this stuff, no one's going to care about the AP poll in 20 years. Nobody. I, I, I... I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you. And Travis, you said, I don't know anyone who takes these 
polls seriously, mostly because of the biased votes. Well, maybe that's where we are. It, it wasn't when I got into this thing. And uh, I'll give you another example. Why is Alabama, why did they get 165 first place votes in the West and LSU gets 117? That should be a lot closer. Let's go to the East. Georgia with 265 first place votes, Tennessee with 14. Uh, that should be a lot closer. Um, and, but, but really, you're right. The one that stands out the most is Vanderbilt. I'll take you to a couple of other ones. Uh, Arkansas receiving three first place votes in the West is silly. Auburn, four place votes, uh, four first place votes in the West is silly. Mississippi State, one first place vote in the West. That's just not going to happen. Overall, Georgia was picked as the SEC champion followed by Alabama, LSU, Tennessee, tied with Vanderbilt at fifth. So this is not just a website putting together a list. This should be your most learned SEC media, and it just doesn't uh, add up to me why anybody would would put Vanderbilt on their ballot. I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's a little pitiful, to be honest with you. It's people who don't take their ballot seriously. And by the way, this is, if you go to other sports, this is why the Baseball Hall of Fame is not taken seriously anymore. Because writers for 100 years have been political about how they vote. I mean, how many baseball superstars didn't get a unanimous vote for the Hall of Fame because the writer's like, well, this player didn't get a unanimous vote, so I, I'm not going to vote for this guy then. And writers being petty like that, media and writers built sports in America. And college football no more than, more than any other sport. And they have completely lit on fire the credibility they've, they've, they've built. Because you and I both know, Dave, those five Vanderbilt voters do not believe in their heart of hearts that Vanderbilt's winning the SEC at all. No. They did this because they thought it was funny. No, I, I completely agree. Have no disagreement with that whatsoever. So the all-SEC team did come out. And let's take a look at that. First team offense – all SEC, there were no Tennessee players on there, which is I know I know people left, but it's kind of phenomenal to think you had a Blitnikoff Award winner, you had a Heisman Trophy candidate. I know they're gone, but to not have one on the first team uh, offense was pretty surprising. Tennessee also didn't have a player on the first team defense. Um, same for specialists. The All SEC second team offense had Brew McCoy which I think is incredibly respectful because of what you hear behind closed doors about Brew McCoy, who I've been told may be the best NFL prospect on this team and likely is. And you had uh, center Seth McLaughlin uh, of Alabama get the second team center position. I'm going to tell you why I don't like that, because I think Cooper Mays, and I talked to some people about this that evaluate talent while we were down there. That uh, Cooper Mays is highly respected. I mean, he's going to be a guy that is going to garner a lot of draft love because of the way he plays with leverage and he's very secure with the football, as you would expect. But Brew McCoy is the only one to make the second team, which given his limited amount of play last year, because you, you, you had Jalen Hyatt catching so many balls and Ramel Keaton uh, caught the unbelievable uh, pass the diving pass and we're constantly worried about Cedric Tillman when's he going to be back I thought it was a little surprising he made second team I think when all said and done Brew McCoy assuming Joe Milton plays like he can will be a first team player at the end of the year so you go down a little bit further a Tennessee with no second team specialist so let's get to the third team offense Joe Milton makes it at quarterback uh, Javante Spragans makes it on the offensive line, and then Cooper Mays makes it on the offensive line. Cooper definitely deserves to be honored. I would have him second team, that's where I voted him. Uh, Spragans, that's very debatable depending on, on which direction you want to go. But Joe Milton, the third, this is a down year at quarterbacks, probably the worst in about 10 years. But you surprised to see him get any sort of nod for first team preseason, I'm sorry, third team preseason all SEC. Were you surprised? I wasn't because I think 
many media members covering college football have been influenced by what happened in spring and where it became very clear that Milton didn't lose the starting job. So there's cautious optimism behind Joe Milton, the same way there is with the person he tied with, which was Mississippi state quarterback, Will Rogers, who was very good last year. People just don't know if he can still be good in Mike Leach's system. So I understand why there was kind of that. I understand how they could be tied for third team together. What surprised me was the overall number. So Tennessee was technically tied for seventh in terms of all SEC players with four in the SEC. But Dave, you know this. There's all SEC numbers and all SEC representation. If you factor in like weight more heavily first team versus second team versus third team, Tennessee was 11th in all SEC representation. Like, I don't think anybody thinks they're going to be one of the four worst teams in the conference this year. So... As media members, do we need to evolve our thinking a little bit? Do we need to include the Dante Thorntons of the world, the Keenan Pillies of the world, those transfers that teams take in that have had success at other schools? That's asking a lot because a lot of these are beat reporters who just cover one school. We pride ourselves in, in having a working knowledge of several schools, primarily uh, Tennessee, as you would imagine. But – I don't know that you'll see transfer portal guys make it in based off pretty much tradition. But if you wanted to make an argument for a Keenan Pilly or in particular a Dante Thornton, I think you could certainly do that. What player, though, not that was a transfer deserves to be on one of these lists that is not currently? I mean, I would say. Obviously, it's got to be Dante Thornton because I believe in him so much as a player. I'm with you in Keenan Peely, but I think Dante Thornton is probably the most deserving. I will tell you the most deserving transfer who's not on this list, and it would be at Tennessee's expense. I, I don't see how you put how you don't put Devin Leary 13 at Kentucky over Milton or Will Rogers. Devin Leary has proven way more as a starting quarterback than either of those guys. That's fair all around, but are there any players that – because I don't think the SEC media is in tune with picking transfer portal players later. Are there any players on Tennessee's roster that played last year for the Vols that you would make an argument should be on this list? Any players that uh, – Squirrel White, I think. If 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 Sometimes they got to factor potential into account. And if anybody saw flashes of Squirrel White, you'd know that he could be an elite superstar this year at receiver for Tennessee. I agree. Um, I think – Ramel Keaton is just a little bit short of that. Um, mm -hmm. And then we get into the running back discussion. I mean, I know Tennessee, like most teams, splits it up between Jabari Small and, and, and Jalen Wright. Um, and they're going to split it up even more with Dylan Sampson this year, I believe. And then we'll see what Cameron's able to do in his first year. But I, I'm kind of surprised that one of those guys didn't, didn't get mentioned at least because – you want to correct me if I'm wrong on this, I think combined they had uh, around about 2,000 yards. I think Jalen was right at 1,000. So to me, if you have 1,000 yards the year before, you should certainly be on this list. Um, I, I don't have a problem with Jaden Daniels being the first team quarterback because if you ask most people who's the best quarterback in the league, most people would say Jaden Daniels. I even asked some people, would you take Jaden And also Daniels? because we're all closeted LSU fans on this site, but you know. That's not true. But I asked him, I said, if you if you were to take Jaden Daniels or or Hendon Hooker going into this year, um, that was about 60-40 um, Hendon Hooker. There were some people who really liked Jaden Daniels' upside. So I'm not surprised that Joe Milton was third. I personally would have him over K.J. Jefferson. I realize that K.J. Jefferson has done more, and uh, but I just – Listen, when we're having a conversation of these guys going on and playing pro ball in about, what, 120 days, K.J. Jefferson may be in the conversation. Joe Milton is going to be in the conversation unless something goes incredibly awry. Yes, yes. And also, you really have to question K.J. Jefferson without – I think Kendall Bryles is gone now, and I think Dan Enos is there, right? So you really have to question K.J. Jefferson this year. So it's hard to know what's going to happen with that. All right, so – um, but, but any other player you think, give me three players that will be on the postseason list that aren't on the preseason list from Tennessee. Yeah. And I'm going to go first. Uh -huh. I'm going to go, um, 
I'm going to go Dante Thornton slash Squirrel White. And then I'm going to go, and then I'm going Beasley and Peely. So I, I really picked four. Two linebackers? Both linebackers are going to be all yes. SEC, man? I think, well, and here's the other thing that works against me is they just do two teams after the year. They do three teams before the year. So I might get burned on this one. But, uh, yeah, that's where I'm going. All right. I'm going to go – I'm just going to say – I'll actually take a stand and I'll say Squirrel White. And I was a Dante Thornton believer before spring practice. But I uh, – you know, my list is fluid and Squirrel White did not give up the slot job. to. So it's going to be Squirrel White for me. Gerald Mincy at right tackle I think is going to shock a lot of people. And then I got a freshman going on there, Jordan Matthews at cornerback. Wow. Not even thinking about Ricky Gibson. You're just good with Jordan Matthews. You know, I love Louisiana kids. <laughs> yeah, you do. All right. So greatest season. Uh, Mr. Jones says Jabari Small should be on there. Travis says KJ Jefferson equals Josh Booty. I don't hate that comparison. Actually, uh, two minutes. Greatest Tennessee football seasons by a quarterback in its long, illustrious history. Two minutes, and we'll get to that. Stay tuned. Caleb Calhoun, Dave Hooker, off the Oak Sports. To own the more that owns every job, then get the Vasti Lawn and Garden in Cleveland and get you a Toro. I'm David Vasti, here to talk to you about Toro. With a Toro Zero turn, you'll get more out of every minute and you'll reach the finish line faster. At Bassey's, we like to say, no matter if you're mowing three acres a week or 11 lawns a day, homeowners and business owners alike find confidence in equipment they can trust from top to bottom. Bassey Lawn and Garden, Highway 60 North in Cleveland. Man alive, it's worth the drive. Hi, Mike Davis here with City Heating and Air, reminding you to always dare to compare. Our team provides quality local heating and air service, installation, and maintenance across East Tennessee. We use only the best equipment like American Standard Heating and Air Conditioning for your residential, new construction, or commercial needs. Honesty, dependability, and customer satisfaction have been the cornerstones of our business since 1961. City Heat and Air. There's repair. Our family has been creating one-of-a-kind pieces of jewelry in West Knoxville since 1986. Each piece is a combination of unique processes that bring your idea to life. Every day in our shop, a truly special item with a story all its own is being manufactured in our facility, bringing the history and family sentiment into a whole new generation of life. We are grateful that you chose us to be Knoxville's best jeweler, a title that we value and respect. Because to me, being a jeweler and owning a jewelry store are not the same thing. I'm Rick Terry, I'm a jeweler, and we want to be your jeweler. Kingston Pike and Campbell Station Road in the heart of Farragut and downtown on Gay Street right next to the Tennessee Theater. With all that sun, sand, and salt water, the beach is a very relaxing place. Unless you wear contacts. Ow! Open your eyes to the best the beach has to offer with LASIK Vision Correction from Campbell Cunningham Laser Center. Ah. You're listening to The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of OffTheHookSports.com. The internet is full of pictures of each and every one of you. Available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the Off the Hook Sports app. Download now for free. Is there nothing you people can't do? Also available on offthehooksports.com. A uh, bit of breaking news, and that is uh, according to Sham Sharimia. I don't know who that is. If you want to help me? Uh, but apparently, USC All American Bronny James collapsed on the court Monday. Statement said yesterday while practicing, Bronny James suffered a cardiac arrest. Medical staff was able to help treat Bronny and take him to the hospital. He is now in stable condition, no longer in ICU. He asked for respect and privacy for the James family. We'll update media when there is more information. LeBron and Savannah wish to publicly send their deepest thanks and appreciation to the USC medical and athletic staff for their incredible work and dedication to the safety of their athletes. So completely surface level. I don't know anything about this to this point, but it, Kind of sounds like that Monday Night Football 
uh, situation that was so terrible. And um, it, it, it actually ties into uh, Tennessee. I don't know if you saw this on Twitter, but uh, Brew McCoy has actually become a part of a uh, foundation to make sure the EKGs that shock your heart back into rhythm. And we, we don't know this has anything, anything like the, the Monday Night Football incident, but he is actually a part of that. And it got pretty good traction on Twitter uh, how it was not only to have those devices available, but Brew McCoy was actually teaching many of his teammates and, um, and uh, many of the people around at this event to be able to give um, um, resuscitation. What's, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Caleb, to be able to uh, you, you, you work their heart. Uh, their revive heart. the heart. Uh, I think it's CPR. CPR. Yes, I'm sorry. Man, my bad. Um, so kudos to him. I, I, the scariest, um, you would know this guy, the scariest um, practice moment that I've ever been a part of. And before we get to the uh, top 10 quarterback seasons in the history of Tennessee football, I'll share this. It was uh, Willie Miles. And um, I, I'm sure that you you know Willie Miles because he was from West Tennessee. Well, this was back when practice was open. So during a moment, Willie goes up for an interception and comes down awkwardly. You couldn't exactly see it from the sideline because there were people around him, but it apparently came down on his head and couldn't move uh, for quite some time, was my understanding. And you had the ambulance come onto the field and it suddenly was uh, breaking news because – we had people at the radio station, Caleb, and you can appreciate this, that monitor the 911 calls, monitor the police scanner. So yeah, I, here I'm in the middle of, they, they thought I somehow leaked it to the, the to our radio station, which I never would have done. But um, yeah, that was scary. That was the scariest moment I've ever been around in practice. It, it was probably, they, they ended practice. That was probably only one of, that may have been the only time they ended practice early was the Willie Miles incident. And he turned out to be okay. He turned out to be okay that night. I think he got back on the practice field the next week, as a matter of fact. But this was in preseason camp. And, uh, yeah, that th those are those moments that remind you, especially when you're there and the ambulance is driving onto the field, which reminds you that football is a very, very, very violent sport. And now we know even more about the possible heart issues and how it can get out of rhythm that we saw on Monday Night Football. Don't know if that's what happened to Brawny or not. I don't care how rich and successful you are. My prayers and thoughts are to his family because you know, having a son that age, as a matter of fact, can you even imagine when you, when you get that phone call? Because that phone call has to go something like this. I want to tell you everything's fine, but uh, we, something happened with Brawny. And those have to be the longest two seconds in your life, right? Because you know they're not calling your cell phone if you're LeBron unless it's something serious. And whew, just just can't even imagine. Yeah, it's kind of scary. And, and Dave, I know you you cover a lot of football players and you you work out a lot. And I, I want to know, do you think we're do you think we are we're, we're working kids out? And this isn't basketball, just like football. Now it's where they're reaching peak like almost like the peak maximum level of like what humans can possibly do, like, like Captain America level of human physical condition. And is it almost, we're starting them now young enough. Is it almost getting unrealistic? Is it going to be, is it, is it dangerous? Honestly, with how in shape we're putting them. Uh, I think that's why I would be very careful to send my kid to a smaller school. I'll give you an example. I know of a guy that works out at our gym in the off season, but he plays for a division three school. Do, do they have the same precautions in place? Do they know the same things? That scares me. That would scare me as a parent a little bit. And But but let's remember, Hank Gathers died on the court. Uh, Reggie Lewis of the Celtics died during a, a, an offseason game on the court. So I think it's better than what it was. I mean, Reggie Lewis passed away, and it was just there was no outcry of let's do something to make sure this never happens again. So in a way, I think our society is better handled uh, to to deal with this. And then again, not referring to any of these situations. I do think the money is always going to be on the player's side. 
So that's why do I believe there are PEDs in sports right now that could push the body to its limit? Yes, because there's more money on the side of pushing the limit than there is on the side of catching those that push the limit, if that makes sense, Caleb. So, you know, if a guy says, I'm going to, I got a collective here of uh, 10 other athletes and we're going to give you a hundred million dollars to come up with, it'll make us better at cricket. Then the cricket federation is not going to spend a hundred million dollars to catch them. Does that make sense? It's just simple supply and demand. Right. Yeah, exactly. No, I totally agree. I think that's where it is too. And it's, um, and it's funny. Then you bring up, this was something else totally because it was self-inflicted, but the limb bias death off the court was so that's, that's where there wasn't a reaction in this country where you know one person did cocaine in this country said let's do these draconian drug laws that lock up nonviolent criminals for the rest of their lives after that and yep. it was probably probably impetus to that but um certainly it was on that direction i think uh i think nancy reagan had us on that direction but that's a whole different show for another day yeah. all right 10 greatest season by a tennessee quarterback we love to do this uh, smoky hot takes as we look back over the years as the balls have had uh, quite the history and quite the history with quarterbacks. So here, here's what I did. Do we have your story up on off the hook sports.com? Cause I purposefully avoided it because I wanted to play. Uh, All right, play I got it up now. now. Okay. All right. So I'm not going to look at it, but I'm going to tell you in my lifetime uh, and we're talking 10 greatest seasons by a balls quarterback. I would go last year, Hendon hooker. I would go 97, Peyton Manning, and that's pretty much it. As I go back as a fan to the late 80s, I'm sure I'm missing one or two, but let's take a look at your list if you want to count them down, and then go ahead and get on that message board and tell me what were what was one of the greatest seasons you ever saw by a Tennessee quarterback. So I kind of got those um, as as my two that I believe stand out. So let's uh, unveil your list. It's on offthehooksports.com, and you can kind of go through that with us. And when you talk about the 10 greatest seasons, you had number one, Peyton Manning, 97. And I, I'm looking at this for the first time. I purposefully – Do you want to count, count down, build up to the top ones? Well, no, because I want to kudo myself on saying I got the top two. Okay. And then you got Hendon Hooker 2022. Now we'll count down. So you start with a guy that had a whip. If he had a David Cutcliffe in his life, he's probably winning Super Bowls and an All-Pro. And his name kind of sounds like Tom Brady, except it's Tyler Bray. Same initials. Yeah, this was very, very hard for me to do. Because Tyler Bray had the worst intangibles, the worst leadership qualities, and the most, the most apathetic approach to the game, he was the Jamarcus Russell of Tennessee football. And I without don't throw the, that word. Without the scissor problem. Without the scissor problem. Didn't care whether Tennessee won, didn't care whether they lost. But I can't ignore the stats in 2012. That is, outside of Peyton Manning in 97 for a pocket passer, the most productive year statistically a pocket passer has ever had at Tennessee outside of Peyton Manning in 97. And so I put it on the list because it's not necessarily his fault that Tennessee went nine, five and seven that year. He didn't hire Sal Sinceri to coach the defense. True. So. Mr. Mr. Jones says T. Martin, 1998. I'm putting that third on my list. Here's a couple of reasons why. Because as you'll read in the Celebrate... Mind. I know. But as you'll read in the Celebrate 98 um, book that uh, we're going to have coming out very shortly and excited about that. It goes to publisher next week. But it... T. Martin could have done more, chose not to do more without griping about it because they didn't feel like he was ready to do more and wanted to be more of a running football team. He also had the big play against Syracuse that converted in a first down, the run, and a couple of other key runs that year. So the fact that I believe he could have done more, he just threw for 2,100 yards, could have done more, I would have him higher on your list. But, yes, probably three is a little too high. Eight, Casey Clawson. 2003 that was kind of the last year if you cover Tennessee football or followed them closely that you just kind of thought Tennessee would have elite ice in their veins quarterbacks for the rest of the duration of the program and as as we've learned that's not necessarily the case but Casey Clawson in uh, 2003 why well I debated between 2003 and 2001 Casey Clawson 
one actually technically was a little bit more efficient of a passer, but O one had Dante Stallworth, Kelly Washington, Jason Witten, and the SEC's best running game. Casey Clawson had no – you remember this. 3 who was his best receiver? It was a converted quarterback. And he had no running game that year whatsoever because Jabari Davis was his feature tailback for most of the year, who wasn't that good of a running back, honestly. And 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 so I think that Casey Clawson, he was the offense in 3 I mean, it was really just him by himself carrying that. And he threw 27 touchdowns. Again, one of the most productive years statistically, threw for 3,000 yards. So I, I that, that was enough for me to put him in the top 10, 03. Yep. Peyton Manning, 1995. That was his breakout season. <clears throat> you stop me when you want to jump in here. Heath Schuler in 1993. You know, that wasn't David Cutcliffe's type of quarterback, as we saw moving forward with the Mannings. But he was fantastic in that year. Then you have Eric Ainge in 2007. You talk about a turnaround. You get David Cutcliffe back involved. And I think it was really simplified. I think it's what Texas A&M is hoping Bobby Petrino will do as the offensive coordinator there. It just kind of simplified everything in 2007. Didn't try to be too cute. And they had better talent than most of the teams they played. And Eric Ainge would have been one of the players that, that was more talented than most of the players he played. Well, yeah, and also you got to remember that 07 year, Eric Ainge lost his go-to receiver in Robert Meacham. And Tennessee's best receiver in 07 was Lucas Taylor. And no one's going to confuse Lucas Taylor with one of the best receivers in Tennessee history. Yet he gained 1,000 yards that year. And I think he gained 1,000 yards because of Eric Ainge's accuracy. And the big story with Eric Ainge that year, David, uh, Dave, do you remember? I think that's still the least sacked team in SEC football history because Eric Ainge got rid of the ball so quickly. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think that still sticks in there. I think that record's still there. Now, you had Hendon Hooker 2021. Then you had Joshua Dobbs 2016 at number three before we get to Hooker 2022 and Manning 97. So talk about Hooker, Dobbs, 21, 16, respectively. And then we had a question on the message board about Jonathan Crompton that I want to address. So 2021 Hooker, and you could actually have a debate for 2021 versus 2022 Hooker. If you look at the stats, it was just he got sacked so much more in 2021 because of his pocket presence. But, I mean, Dave, can anybody argue with 36 touchdowns and three interceptions? I mean, that's like – insane i got josh dobbs number three and you almost could have made a case for dobbs at number two dave you may not know this but in terms of total offense by quarterbacks dobbs 2016 season is second only to peyton manning's in 97 and he was doing that with butch jones as his coach not josh heichel so there's an argument for dobbs at, at that season at second right there no i think you could argue dobbs for second i think um he, here's my top five and not a particular order and I am factoring in team success, and I hate it when people when people say, "Oh, this guy won uh, four Super Bowls, so he's automatically a great quarterback." That shouldn't be a stat, but team success does mean something. But before I get to my five, success means calling Andy Mason at andymasonrealestate.com. You've got the number there. You've got the form fill where you can get the best service, the best prices in East Tennessee. I'm proud to tell you about andymasonrealestate.com. If you have any sort of real estate move that you need to make best service best prices in the biz andy mason real estate.com support our advertisers so we can keep coming to you each and every weekday at 10 a.m so my top 10 or i'm sorry top five would consist of hand and hooker number one in 2022 peyton manning number two in 1997 I'm giving your guy Josh Dobbs a shout out for three because I think he overcame bad coaching. So I'm adding in a lot of extracurriculars. Uh, I thought that what he Schuler did, I would have him in my top five. Again, no particular order in 93. He was just really fearless when it came to uh, going on the road. And then I'm going to have T Martin in my top five because I believe he could have done more. He chose not to do more because that was the best for the team. So that's my top five in no particular order. So finally, we disagree on something. This has been the big Yeah, and you're – Like we've been hugging it out. You are so wrong on Peyton Manning and Hendon Hooker and compare – Like Peyton Manning in 97 is the gold standard. And I want to tell you a couple of reasons why. Peyton Manning did not have a Bolitnikoff winner he was throwing to at receiver. And I'm going to tell you this right now. Cedric Till, his go-to receiver was Marcus Nash. 
Dave, what did Marcus Nash do in the NFL? Not much. Complete, he, exactly, complete flame out. Peyton Manning did not have Josh Heifel coaching him. You could save David Cutcliffe, but David Cutcliffe wasn't the guy that maximized quarterback stats the way Josh Heifel did. And Peyton Manning, statistically, production-wise, that is the number one total offense here ever by a quarterback. And Peyton Manning didn't even have any rushing yards to add to his total offense because he couldn't run. Pure pocket passer. And so it's easily Peyton Manning, and he won the SEC title, which, say what you want, Hinton Hooker didn't do. Mr. Jones said it for me. Hooker made the Blitnikoff winner. I agree with that. So I have no problem putting Hendon Hooker. We'll find out, but I have no problem putting Hendon Hooker above the 9017. And also, you know, Travis says no. Peyton made Marvin Harrison too, which, which he you know. did. He did. Marvin Harrison was an average receiver until Peyton Manning got to Indy. And look at the stats, people who question me. I would actually take Tom Brady's receivers in the early 2000s, Deion Branch and Troy Brown over Marvin Harrison. Don't call me crazy on that, but I would. No, I could argue that. The other point you make about team. I Marvin, can't even remember who played opposite Marvin Harrison at this very moment. This was before Reggie Wayne. So, yeah, Reggie yeah, Wayne was kind of a. Reggie Wayne was a real deal. I think we would argue with that. He was better than Marvin. No I question. would say this with T. Martin because you not at, everyone not at killing people. Oh my gosh! Sorry. You would you keep saying you know, and I hear Fred say this, and I, I don't like to be disrespectful like this because I have a lot of respect for T. Martin. But everybody acts like he was held back in '98. Dave, R Randy Sanders turned T. Martin loose in '99, and he was much less efficient. There's a reason Cutcliffe kept the harness on T. Martin. And now you could argue maybe it's because Cutcliffe wasn't calling the plays in 99. And I, I might listen to you, but you tell me, was it more the Cutcliffe to Sanders transition? Or was it more Martin wasn't capable of taking that large of a role? Mm, probably a little bit of both. Probably a little bit of both. He's Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker. This has been a presentation of Off the Hook Sports 10 a.m. with no TDs, not touchdowns, technical difficulties. We'll visit with you. Each and every weekday, we're practically in football season. Ball is reporting the beginning of August, so there is a lot going on. For Caleb Calhoun, I'm Dave Hooker. This has been a